Okay, thank you. Um, we have, why don't we take um, just a five minute break and Kathleen, would you like to take a five minute break or go right into community schools? You, if you want to any, uh, yeah, what, whatever everybody wants. Okay, I'm ready. If that's why don't you go ahead? Why don't you go ahead and, and introduce your part of it, and then we'll see if we'll take a little break before Jim goes through his part. Okay, that sounds great. Okay. Um, yeah. So just like Sarita, um, so I wouldn't ramble. I I wrote um, I wrote a little intro, um, and it's really just um, an update, a little bit of an update um, of the bill introduction I did last year because. Um, as folks who are new to the committee may not know, um, Chair Webb and I introduced this bill last year and um, got as far as talking about it in committee for an hour and then COVID. So um, the bill is back um, and it's back because um, I believe that it's more relevant than, than ever. Um, so I'll just read my, uh, read my little intro. So, we're talking about H106, an act relating to equitable access um, to a high quality education through community schools. All schools are located in a community. So what's a community school? As described in this bill, it's a public school that actively partners with families and with community organizations like health and social service agencies, nonprofits, businesses, local farms, institutions of higher education, to offer well-rounded and wide-ranging opportunities, resources, and supports that help every student succeed. And because these strategies are intentionally and specifically designed to reflect each school's particular needs and the community assets it can harness, no two community schools look alike. Community schools, as described in, the, uh, in sort of the traditional model, are a flexible strategy that includes four pillars. Pillar one is integrated student supports. Pillar two is expanded and enriched learning opportunities. Pillar three is significant family and community engagement. And pillar four is a collaborative leadership team. So uh, pillar one, by integrated student supports, we mean things like access to medical care, dental care, mental health resources for students and families, and additional things like even job training or assistance with affordable housing or nutrition. Pillar two, by expanded and enriched learning, we mean opportunities that go beyond the classroom, like after school programs, summer programs, or partnerships with businesses to provide internships, volunteer opportunities, or mentoring. Pillar three, by family and community engagement, we mean things that bring families and community members into the school and vice versa. So programs that engage parents in the school and in their students' success, uh, classes, training, or even social events for families and community members, and opportunities for shared leadership. So the school starts to feel like a community hub. And these stronger connections between home, school, and community are in turn shown to uh, improve student outcomes. And finally, pillar four, community schools have a collaborative leadership approach that extends beyond um, the administration to include families, community members, and uh, local organizations. So um, Kate knows because she was with me, I first heard about uh, community schools in July, 2019 um, at a conference, pre-COVID obviously, um, the National Forum on Education Policy in Denver. And uh, there was an afternoon seminar on community schools and I, I thought it sounded interesting. Um, so I attended and I learned about schools in cities like New York, Philadelphia, Miami and Boston that are accomplishing some really powerful things, really transformational stuff through the community schools strategy. But I didn't know if it was relevant to Vermont. Um, so I reached out to the Education Commission of the States, ECS, on uh, how the community school model is being applied in rural states and regions. Uh, the report gave examples from around the country. 
And I was surprised and pleased to learn that Molly Stark Elementary School in Bennington, which is about 25 miles from me, um, was included in the report as uh, an example. And it's been using many, many of these strategies for years. Um, on the day that uh, Kate and I visited Molly Stark in October 2019, there was a truck from the Vermont Food Bank parked outside and families were coming to fill bags with produce and pick up recipes inside the building. Um, there was a whole room set aside for um, a dental chair and um, a, you know, a local dentist comes in to provide services for um, students who qualify. Um, and in another wing of the building, um, there was a, uh, a pre-K and there were other uh, clinics and, and um, programs for kids. And they also offer summer camps in math, reading and writing for kids in, in all grades. Um, they had a childcare facility as well there too, all in the same building. So much more recently, and I mean much more recently, um, I've started to learn that Vermont is home to many more schools um, that have adopted really interesting variations of this approach, and that there are a lot of educators around our state that are actively engaged in this work, and they're thinking about community schools in a much more kind of long range and broad way. Um, so the question is why? Um, we hear all the time in this committee that children are arriving in school with a wide range of really complex needs, stemming from poverty, hunger, housing insecurity, substance use disorder. Um, this really impacts their ability to learn. Um, and it, it impacts their ability to listen, to focus, to engage in the classroom, and that becomes an equity issue. So the community school strategy is a proven approach. Um, I have, we have data and studies that we can send along when it's time to talk about this. Um, it can help boost attendance, academic achievement, and graduation rates. It can help close the economic and racial achievement gap. And in terms of funding, um, schools that adopt this model can uh, unlock or access additional funding through the federal um, Every Student Succeeds Act. Um, because it meets ESSA's standard of evidence-based approaches for eligible, eligible schools. So anyway, that's uh, probably enough for me. This bill is model legislation. Um, the Vermont NEA helped me to find it. It's based on Minnesota, New York, and Tennessee. So I, I'm really excited to take testimony, um, to learn more about this idea, and to hear how we can adapt it um, and offer it as a pilot program, um, as it's envisioned here for 10 schools um, here in Vermont. So thanks. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, I'm inclined to say, shall we power through? Power through. Okay, we'll power through. We'll take a break after, after this, after the discussion. Thank you very much. Um, Jim. Okay, so um, let's try to <laughs> share screens again, see if this will work. Do you mind? Absolutely, bringing so that up can now. Give me, can you co host? I'm going to try to do it myself. Oh, sure. You should still be a co host. Okay, all right. So share screen. Let me just see which one this is. Uh... <laughs> wow. Uh, so one, okay. Hmm. Sorry, everyone. This have to find. I'm not finding it on the. Okay, just go ahead. Sorry, you have to do it for me. Not a problem. Sometimes it helps if you hit show all windows, not necessarily for now, but for the future there. Hit them all. Yeah, there's a little a little window on the bottom right that says show all screens and sometimes that that helps. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, well, um, okay, for the record again, uh, Jim Danbury, let's con. So we're walking through H106. And if we could scroll down. Um, this is obviously the uh, community school bill. 
And let's go down to the findings. I'm not going to read through the findings in detail. I do want to highlight a couple though. Um, um, so the first two findings are about the issues with lack of opportunity for students um, uh, on an equal basis um, and uh, issues around low income households. Let's go down to finding number three and four. Uh, so three says uh, community schools facilitate the provision of comprehensive programs and services that are carefully selected to meet the needs of students and families. Uh, so it's a substance of misuse, lack of stable housing, and uh, inadequate medical and dental care, hunger, trauma, experience, exposure to violence. So students can do their best. Four talks about the, the, the four areas that uh, Rep. James just went through. Uh, so the four key pillars um, are integrated student supports, expanding and enriching learning time and opportunities, uh, three, active family and community engagement, and four, collaborative leadership and practices. Okay. And then uh, the findings go on to talk about, uh, five is talking about the results um, that can be gained um, from improvement in this area. Uh, six talks about uh, the return on investment. So if you scroll down a bit further, uh, talking about um, we saw invested uh, in a community coordinator position and returns seven dollars in net benefits. And then likewise talks about um, every dollar invested in various programs and you hold up to fourteen dollars and eighty cents in return. And then the next finding uh, is about COVID nineteen recovery and how this could help with that. Um, so let's go down to section three which is the kind of part of the bill. Now this bill is, is kind of difficult to read through because there are a lot of long definitions at the beginning. And what I want to do is um, first go to the definition of eligible school so you can just see which schools could apply for, for this funding. So let's go down just to page um, all the way down to page uh, seven for a minute. And scroll down further to the bottom. Okay, right here. Oh, up there, right there. So eligible school uh, means a public elementary or secondary school that as a student by where at least 40% of students are eligible for free or reduced lunch, okay, or it's been identified for targeted support under federal or state law. So it's beginning here because not every school is eligible for this funding. It's schools basically with a high percentage of students uh, living in poverty. Um, or schools are targeted for improvement. So if we can go back up then to page four, and um, we're looking now at the definition of scroll down a bit. Yeah, definition of community schools itself. Um, so we're on line th th thirteen. So this talks in detail uh, A, B, C, and D. We're talking in detail about the four areas that Rep. James mentioned. Um, I'm not sure that we have to go through all of them in detail, but first is a means. Um, a, 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 a community school has to have all four of these, okay? So first is integrated school supports, uh, which is around uh, partnerships with social and health service agencies. So for example, for providing med medical, dental, vision care, et cetera. Next pa page, um, B, deals with expanded and enriched learning time and opportunities. This is before school, after school, weekend, summer programs, et cetera. C, on line nine, talks about active family and community engagement, which brings students, families, and the community into the school as partners. Um, and that could be providing adults with access to um, various opportunities for themselves, 
um, as well. And then D talks about collaborative leadership and practice, which is building a culture of professional learning and collective trust and show responsibility um, around school leadership. Okay, keep going down. Then we've got a bunch of positions and kind of groups that are identified. So we have a community school director. Uh, that means a person who is a staff member of an eligible school um, and is responsible for identification, implementation, and coordination of the four areas we just talked about. Uh, and serves as a member of the school-based leadership team, which we'll come on to. And very importantly, D, serves as the lead for the needs and assets assessment and community school plan. We'll come on to that, but basically what that's talking about is that um, in order to apply for these, this grant funding, the eligible school would have to do a needs and assets assessment. So what needs do they have um, and what resources do they have to meet those needs? And what are the gaps? And then I have to come up with a plan basically to address that. So that's what that's talking about. Um, and then also this position um, leads the uh, leads the needs and the assessment. Assessment, it's, it's they call it called a different approach. So basically this, this role coordinates a lot of that activity. Then you've got a term that says uh, community school initiative director. So if you scroll down a bit more, Jess, um, the key thing here is um, on like 2021. So the, the, the community director we just talked about, that's kind of overall coordination. But the initiative director is working across three eligible schools. Um, so if you have, for example, an SU with um, three eligible schools or more, um, this person would help coordinate among those schools the delivery of um, the community school program. Let's go down a bit further. And then you have uh, you have a community wide leadership team, and then you have you have a, a more local team as well coming up. So the community wide leadership team is at the SU level and uh, guides vision policy, resource alignment, implementation, oversight, and goal setting for the community school programs. And the team has to include many stakeholders, which are listed here. And then you have, if you scroll down further, we talked about the eligible school. Um, let's go on further to seven on the next page. So we have now the definition of a school-based leadership team. So we talked about the SU team, overall coordination. Now you have a more local team at school level that is responsible for assessing that particular school's needs, develop, develop the goals, et cetera. Um, and that's comprised of school and community representatives. We have not less than one third parents or local residents and not less than one third teachers and other school staff. Um, and then you've got lastly a definition of uh, teacher learning communities, which is a group of instructional staff who are given time to plan uh, to, uh, to examine their practice and student performance and improve school policy. So that's a lot of definitions I appreciate. Um, that's why this was a little bit complicated to go through, but go back to them, or I'll have to go back over them again with you, of course. Um, B talks about the assistance from the agency of education. So again, it's going to be as it was in the literacy bill, providing um, technical assistance, SUs, uh, giving the materials. Uh, so for educational purposes, assisting them with forming a task force uh, to study the creation um, of um, administration of community schools. And then um, informing SUs to the availability of grants, helping them with their applications, uh, and looking for other sources of funding. Uh, and then coordinating across the agencies. Okay, 
So C, uh, line 10, is the grant funding. So how this works is the agency is authorized to provide uh, planning, implementation, and renewal grants. So let me pause there. There are three grant programs here. So a plan grant, an implementation grant, and a renewal grant. So the planning grant is for a one-year grant up to $20,000 for each eligible school. So you have the SU with three eligible schools, that would be $60,000, uh, so it's per school. Um, we'll talk about, the, we'll talk about what, what that's used for momentarily. And then after the planning grant, you have an implementation grant of 110,000 for a year, uh, for a, a year, for three years for each eligible school. So again, if you have three, three eligible schools in an SU, you have $330,000 um, to implement. And then at the conclusion of that three-year period, you can apply for a renewal grant uh, of, again, 110,000 annually for three years. So you can get basically one year of planning grant, three years of implementation grant, and three years further of uh, renewal, renewal grant funding. Um, so D talks about um, what, what you have to do for the planning grant. That's a twenty thousand dollars for planning activities. So next page. Okay. So applicants will submit an application for this uh, planning grant. Uh, has to describe the uh, community-wide leadership team and the school-based leadership team, um, and the process of a place to establish the teams has to describe the process and timeline for conducting a needs and assets assessment and community plan, school plan for each school. And uh, C, if you scroll down a bit further, uh, if applicable, grants for hiring staff or providing additional comp compensation to staff. Um, and then in that application, the applicants will make an assurance that the applicant intends to apply for implementation grant within six months of receipt of a planning grant. And then it says planning grant funds shall be used for the following activities. The establishment of um, uh, the various teams, um, the conducting of a needs and an asset assessment. We're gonna come on to that further again and crafting the community school plan. Uh, for the school. And then next page, uh, it says that the planning grant funds may be used for hiring additional staff uh, or uh, providing additional comp compensation to existing staff or contracting with others. And then E talks about the application for the implementation and renewal grant. So those are the two other grants. The ones are for 110,000 for three year periods. Um, so um, it says that uh, eligible applicants shall submit an application for an implementation or renewal grant to the agency and for each eligible school that, that shall include. And then scroll down a bit further. Now we're talking about the needs and assets assessment, which I've mentioned a few times. Um, uh, so it has to include this assessment that includes where available student demographic, academic achievement, school climate data disaggregated by major demographic groups, including protected classes, um, and access to and need for integrated support, integrated student, sorry, up a little bit. Oh yeah, access and need for integrated support, student supports, and access and need for expanded and risk learning time and opportunities, opportunities um, and school funding information um, for pupil uh, salaries, etc. Keep going down. It has to also include information on the number of qualifications and stability of school staff, on active family and community engagement information. Won't read all of this. Uh, keep going down, Jess. F. Um, okay. Um, so. 
uh, has to include uh, the uh, description of the collaborative leadership uh, and practices, uh, including the teams, uh, the teaching learning communities, et cetera, um, and opportunities for partnerships with nonprofits and other organizations uh, to coordinate services. Going down further. Um, and then um, I should include uh, community climate indicators like housing instability, unemployment, poverty, et cetera. Uh, and um, then it talks about the community school plan, which has to provide a description of a number of things. So how the director, uh, directors will be expected to fulfill their responsibilities, uh, collaborative leadership practices, so et cetera. There's a lot here in terms of what has to be in the application. I won't read through all of it, but keep scrolling down for a bit. There's just, um, yeah. Okay, it's up here. Um, so there's a lot in that application for uh, a grant, whether it's an initial grant uh, for the three years or the, the grant that is a renewal grant. Uh, so all of that has to be in the application for these grants. And next it talks about um, what you have to do with that money. So um, one talks about um, a program, programming services and activities to be tailored to the uh, school's needs as identified in the needs and asset assessment. Um, and um, uh, sorry, I've got a few, something pops up on my screen. Um, Um, so this is what you're doing with funding. So you're providing the, 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 the director, um, uh, the coordinating services are across the, um, SU or the schools, uh, the maintain their school based leadership team and teacher learning communities, so on for the Jess. Uh, they're implementing, oh, okay. They're implementing at least, uh, at least two of the following integrated student supports. So they have a choice of which one to do here. They're listed here, one through, um, read down, but uh, they have to implement two of these. So access to health services, access to nutritional services, access to programs to provide assistance to students who have been chronically absent. Uh, keep going down, Jess. Keep going down. Um, for, keep going down. Yep. Um, okay, it's up there. Um, then um, they have to implement expanded and rich learning, learning time opportunities, which may include various things. So additional academic instruction before, after school, etc. And E says they have to implement at least two active family and community engagement strategies. And they're listed here too. If you scroll down further, just um, so like on site, early education care, home visitation, et cetera. And keep going down. Yeah. Uh, okay. And then let's stop here um, on evaluation. So at the end of the initial three year grant period of, of an implementation award, and um, the, if you have a renewal grant, the third year when that grant ends, each of our school shall undergo an evaluation done by the agency. That evaluation shall include um, uh, a minimum information under E1 and 2. So we're talking about, um, we're talking now about the needs and assessment in, in the community school plan. Um, so it has to include the impact on academic achievement and opportunities, school climate, integrated school support, expanded and rich learning time opportunities, active family, scroll down, and community engagement, et cetera. So it has to have quite a bit of detail in it, um, and, uh, outcomes, and then goes down further. Then on, on before December 15, 2023, uh, the agency has to report to the General Assembly and the Governor on the impact of the program, uh, which will be made publicly available. Um, 
yeah, you disaggregate that as best as you can. And then go down further. Appropriation of funds. Okay, so we have an appropriation of 1.529 million from the education fund in fiscal year 22 uh, provide grant funding under this program. That's for the planning grant, implementation grant, and renewal grant. But in the first year, it would just be the, um, for the plan grant. Um, and I guess plan grants and also the implementation grant for the first year. And then not more than 10% of the funds can be used for technical assistance um, and not more than 5% for evaluations that are, are required. And scroll down further. And effective date is on passage. So that was a, little, a, lot, a lot of information. <laughs> Another simple little bill. Yeah. Thank you. If you're if you're a little overwhelmed, that's you're you're, you're in good company. <laughs> now, Jim, this is this was a, a, a sort of a template bill that you put into Vermont language, correct? Is that right? Correct. It came in uh, as Rip James mentioned. It came from uh, outside source, uh, kind of a combination of other states' laws. It was given to me as a package, like as language. Mm -hmm. So all I've, done, I've really done with it is put it into our form, our format. Okay, thank you. Um, Representative James Ben Williams. Great. Um, that was a lot, and um, I guess as the as the bill's you know lead sponsor, what I pr primarily wanted to say was that if if I, I had had the knowledge to give this bill to Jim and have him write it from scratch, I'm sure it would have been a lot simpler um, and probably not included so many detailed definitions. So what I just wanted to do for the committee super quickly is to say that this bill <laughs> identifies schools that are eligible. So you have to have um, a certain th poverty um, threshold or be identified as needing help. So it identifies schools that could apply for this. It um, sets up a pot of grant money that they can draw from to implement this. And it outlines the things that they have to do. So what you have to do is you have to spend a year planning and um, that means that you take a look at your um, school and what your school needs are, and you take a look at your community and what your community has to offer, and you develop a plan, a community schools plan. And then if you are approved by the Agency of Education, you get um, $130,000 uh, to implement the program. And that is primarily used to hire somebody. So all of that language was about hiring a community schools coordinator or director or whatever you wanna call it. And the reason is because the research has proven that it's really important to have a dedicated person on staff who is um, implementing this plan, who's working with the community, who's working with the SU or across the district. You can't just say to like a social studies teacher, hey, spend a couple hours a week being our community schools coordinator. It's, it's not effective. So the money goes to hire somebody whose job it's gonna be to set up all these interesting partnerships and programs and connections to run this program at the school. And then um, you uh, have to indicate that you're making progress. It's intended to be a three-year pilot. And in the end, you report on how it improved outcomes at your schools along metrics that you have determined are gonna measure whatever it is you're trying to achieve. That is what this bill is. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Kathleen. That was much more clear than I was. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I had to read it a million times to get, you know, it's an incredibly wordy bill. And, I, you know, maybe in Vermont, we do things differently. Maybe a lot of this stuff would have been in the, would have come later in the AOE grant, for example. So anyway, that's what this does. And I wanna come back to the thought that this is an exciting program. We have schools in Vermont that are doing this in exciting ways. 
And um, I can't wait to hear testimony from these folks because it's going to bring this bill to life in a way that that, that language can't. <laughs> That's what it is. It's a grant program. Um, the amount of money that we've built into the bill is um, random. It's 10 schools. It's enough money for 10 schools. Um, last year it was 2 million, uh, you know, so I scaled it back. Um, it's scalable and it gives, it provides money for 10 schools to develop a, 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 a plan that's completely tailored to their community and their school and hire somebody to run it. Okay, I'm done. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> Thank you, Representative James. Representative Williams. Yes, I think you, um, Representative James explained it very well, and I, I really appreciate that. <clears throat> Just a couple technical things that I don't understand, uh, not being a part of the legislature for very long. Um, well, two things is a community school, a, a public school with different narratives and, and programs, and does this if it gets approved, have to be passed now to the appropriations for approval for the monies. That's okay. Um, second question is easy, yes. Um, it would have to go to a probes where um, a probes would talk about the funding. So I mean, that's- Ways and means, because it's dead funds, so. Ways, yeah. w would it be um, advantageous to have them part of our discussions so they, know where we're coming from or, or they just say, okay, they know what they're talking about. So we're just gonna decide if we're gonna give them the money. Chair Webb, why don't you, you've, you're the elder here, sure. uh, not in chronological years. Although- well, that too, yeah. <laughs> that too. Um, yes, it, it, this is not something that we surprise them with. Um, okay. we, we will have context in ways and means and context in appropriations. So this is something that, that we would, this would not be a surprise attack. Okay. Um, last year, it went through ways and means. No, no, it didn't. That was literacy. This one, that, this one didn't make it out of committee. Mm -mm. Uh, but yes, it, it, it's a process when there's money in it. Okay. So the first question, is it considered a public school and supported by the state? Yeah, it, somewhere in that long bill, it says that you have to be a public school in order to be eligible to apply. So this is a this is a public school bill. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say is about the four pillars. Um, you know, this is model language, and it's based on um, it's based on something called the Community Schools Playbook that was developed by the Learning. Policy Institute, which is a, um, it's basically a, a, a think tank. And um, so, the, you know, the, the four pillars, it, that's how the Learning Policy Institute and the Community School book, uh, Schools Playbook, which is a, an actual book that I have that I've mostly read, um, that's how they define community schools. Um, what would be interesting to me to see, I mean, we have to have clear definitions. If, if it's gonna be a grant and schools are gonna apply, you know, it can't just be this open-ended thing. Um, but those def definitions did come from this particular institute. And when we start taking testimony, I'll be curious to hear um, how some of the schools around Vermont, like Thetford um, Academy is doing incredible work in this area. And um, I don't know that their community schools model as they define it includes these four pillars. Thank you. Yeah, and Molly Stark's been doing this for, for years. And uh, you know, I, I think Molly Stark may even predate, I'm not sure who came first, you know, this definition or Molly Stark. They, they've been doing this work for a really long time. So hold that because we're gonna to wanna to get to who we wanna hear from, but I wanna get a few more names, a few, few more people here, Representative Conlon and them too. Yeah, uh, Kathleen, thanks for your summation there at the end. It definitely helps give everybody a, a better picture here. Um, and it is a big complicated bill and it makes me happy that we are in a biennium and not a single year to make things happen. Um, just a couple questions for Jim. Uh, first of all, just in my reading through it, it may need another sort of read through to 
um, differentiate between SUs and SDs. I noticed on page nine, there were two, number three and number four, one used SU, one used SD. Okay, um, yep. Yep, uh, but I, here's my, my concern is that this is maybe uh, really a bill for large schools. And so my question, Jim, is, would a group of three very small elementary schools joining together qualify as a grant applicant? Well, let's go back and look at that definition. Um, so I'll just read. Um, you know what? So eligible school why means... We, why don't we hold that as one of the questions that we have? Yeah, uh, perfect. That's, yeah. that's fine by me. Okay. So could I chime you? in? If not... It, it should be that way, I think. So let's think about that. Okay, so we have numbers of schools. Just to say, currently it's a, a school, not multiple schools. So it would be on a school by school basis as opposed to a group. Okay, thank you. Um, Representative Tu. Uh, thanks, Chair Webb. Um, Kath, I really like the idea of this bill. It's uh, you've, we've talked offline about it a few times, and and I think, you know, first of all, when when we say during the middle of uh, COVID nineteen, we talk about people going into the school, it kind of might make us take a step back. But I think in the long run, this is something that could be good. Uh, obviously, the the money is something that I'm a little cautious about, um, specifically where we are with our school spending. But long term with the anticipation with um, you know, student enrollment going down, I think this is a good idea for uh, use of the buildings. I think that having less students in the school, you, have, you still have the infrastructure there that can be utilized. What is some of your long-term goals with this bill? I know right now you're looking at 10 schools. I think your vision was, would probably be every <laughs> school. I, you know, I, I haven't thought about that too much simply because where I stop and where I think we need to have the conversation is, is just like you said, we're in the middle of a pandemic and this bill has money in it. And, you know, so what I would like to see is, and I'm also, um, I'm, I'm amazed Sarita hasn't chimed in. You know, I'm also kind of a data person. So I, I would really wanna see um, how those first, let's say, let's say 10 schools get approved. You know, um, I would really want to see the data and see how the program worked and um, how it was, you know, demonstrating measurable outcomes. And, and then we go from there. I mean, that's why what I like about this bill is that it's a pilot. You know, um, a, no schools that don't want to take this on have to do anything about this. Um, schools that are motivated and have the capacity and have the interest can pursue it. And then three years down the road, we've got data to see, hey, 10 schools really made this work, um, you know, and look at what it accomplished. And maybe those schools uh, roll it into their budget. Yeah. You know, or maybe it's something that stays on the ed fund. I, I really don't know, but I haven't looked beyond being super interested in this approach, thinking it's probably transformative and wanting to see data on how it really works on some schools that go for it in a very defined apples to apples way. Okay, thank and you. And I agree with what you say about the buildings, by the way. Um, you know, this could really have some long-term implications for what we do with our school buildings as well. And, um, I, you know, I know I'm going on and on about this because I think it's just, I, I think it's such an interesting program but the, the way, you know, this has a lot of implications for farm to school with, you know, local agriculture and resiliency. It has a lot of implications for um, a civic engagement, you know, in terms of getting kids involved, maybe in local government um, and vice versa. And boy, the business mentorships and apprenticeships. Yeah, and that's what I, that's how I see it. I see it as a, as a transition to, you know, tech in school, uh, internships or whatever, you know, working on uh, using those spaces for uh, improving, you know, students' careers and what, you know, introducing them to things earlier in life. Um, so, yeah, I mean, thank you. You know, imagine like a makerspace in a school where entrepreneurs come in 
and, you know, use some space that hasn't been used before and the kids go in there. And I mean, the possibilities are endless. Exactly. So I um, want to just uh, focus us in for a moment. Um, I have a couple of things. I noticed that uh, yesterday the secretary used the term full service schools, um, which I would think is similar to the concept of a, of a community school. Um, I also hear that this has the possibility for one-time funds, but it also has budgetary Im implications um, and position for school budgets. Um, I want to know who do you want to hear from? Uh, AOE and Ted um, Fisher has the bill and I think he shared it um, with Jess DeCarolis. So mm -hmm. I'd, I'd want to hear from them who, um, so AOE, um, the Vermont NEA I know is very supportive of the community schools bill and, and Colin knows a lot about um, this. Um, then there are some, uh, there's some groups of practitioners who um, are really studying and engaging, doing kind of deep work on the um, community schools concept in Vermont. And I, I forget the name of the, I'm sorry, I'm just having a almost senior moment. I'm having a mid senior moment. So that group. And then I think we need to get some schools in. Um, and I can work with Jesse on, on a list. I, I haven't reached out to Molly Stark recently, so I don't want to surprise them. Um, Thetford Academy um, has been listed as a great example. Winooski High School is doing some work so we could hear from some schools. Um, and I'm probably forgetting um, some important people too. Um, so, uh, Representative Austin. Uh, um, thank you. I'm, I, you know, I was just kind of listening um, to Casey and Kathleen. I'm just, I have two questions and um, I'm wondering again, um, could this be a, uh, a revenue source for schools? I mean, I don't know what the Act 60 law is in terms of not mingling or commingling uh, revenue sources. I think it's with the municipality, but um, could these entities be paying rent to the school to use the space in the school? That's just a question. I'm just wondering about that or fees or anything like that. Um, and also for the Vermont State Colleges, I mean, this, is, this would be another, I mean, use of some of these big buildings um, as well. So those, those are just two thoughts that I had. Others. So this might end up being something that could take a little bit of small group work. Um, some folks sort of uh, working offline and, and bringing something back to us. Um, I'll put that out as a, as a possibility. Um, so in terms of testimony, we're looking at the Agency of Education. We're looking at what we affectionately call the Vs. Uh, we're looking at practitioners. Um, anything else that we can think of? Any EA? Yeah, I have them scrolled into the into the school advocate. Vs, okay. Into the Vs, yeah. Or the usual suspects is what they call them in themselves. Um, Representative Brady? I wonder about some of the um, the non-ed partners here, like the like community health centers, like some of those other groups that are going to end up being touched by this. Sorry, there's clarinet in the background. Um, <laughs> I can't make him not go to a Zoom clarinet class. No, um, you have to go. Uh, <laughs> So, but I wonder about some of those so that, so that it, I mean, it is an ed bill, but so that it isn't just, I mean, what we're talking about here is, is bigger. So, you know, those, the, the dental group, the, um, you know, some of those other groups that are going to be touched by this and that could be part of some of those community schools. Yeah. That's, that's good. And I can't tell you how much I'm enjoying that. I know. Um, <laughs> That's a good idea. Uh, I need to think a little bit about who those folks would be, but they're, they would know. People would know who are not me. Some of the community centers, perhaps. Okay. Um, Representative Williams. Just a quick uh, comment. 
uh, a kind of a crazy one. Tell me why uh, public schools and community schools can't be one and the same. Is it a mindset? Why, why isn't everyone buying into this? <laughs> Is that for me? <laughs> I think that's I think that's for the universe. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Well, it's, remember, uh, remember, remember that, you know, we've been educating, had had laws about educating children since the Constitution. And <laughs> education was delivered a little differently back then. <laughs> so but it, I, it's a very good question, particularly as we're seeing more children um, struggling with poverty, mental health issues. Yep. And I guess, yeah, I guess I would just add, I mean, it's, it's the same thing. I mean, you know, a community school, and I'll, I'll go ahead and use, you know, air quotes, um, but a community school as defined in this bill is a public school that does this, 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 and that. So you could turn a public school into a community school uh, yes. just by the vote of the people or the... Uh... No, not the not the vote of the people so much. The um, the you know in this bill anyway, a community school um, is any any public school that adopts this model. Okay, right? I got that. I heard that. Thank you. You bet. However, it does nothing that says that a school board can't decide to implement some of these things and just run it through their own right. you know, budgeting process. Yeah. Right, Representative Brady. Okay, um, so if people think of other folks to include on this, uh, we'll be working on testimony on the literacy bill, working on testimony for community schools. Um, I wanna take a little break and then we will pick up, um, in fact, maybe we should come back at 11. Um, I just wanna make sure that Representative Sebelia was uh, invited. Was she invited to this meeting? Um, yes, she was. She was, and we were set for 11, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, I, I think what I, I should do then to honor that is, is have us come back at 11, which is going to give you, well, it's, it's 20 minutes, isn't it? Um, let me, can you just hold a minute and let me just see if I can reach her? <laughs> and, Kate? Sorry. Sorry, I hear you. <laughs> yeah, it's it's strange being on YouTube. I, I'm now hearing from people who are watching. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. That's strange. So I have the name of the group. <laughs> uh, you, you forget that we're broadcasting live. That's right. <laughs> Um, it is the Vermont Education Equity Project. All right. Why don't I just send a note to, um, to Representative Sebelia. Why don't we come back at 10 of, that gives everybody about 10 minutes. Okay. So we can go on break. Okay, um, we are continuing with looking at bills and right now, um, thank you, Jim Demeray, our Ledge Council for walking us through or, or uh, presenting to us the options that are, are coming forward related to addressing the waiting study. So um, yeah, for the record, Jim Demeray, first thing we're gonna do is um, go through a a brief deck just to give you context for how the waiting report and the issues link back to Brigham and the whole question about equity. Okay. So um, if you would just bring up that presentation. 
on the website. Definitely. It's one that reads um, from the foundation plan to bring them to Act 60, <laughs> et cetera. Thank you. Oops. There we go. Good. Okay. So we will be going through two bills today, um, Representative's bill um, and uh, Senator Bruce bill on, um, on the wait, waiting study. But before going there, I wanted to give you context for, for this. Um, so that's what I'm doing now. Um, if we can go to slide two, Jess. So I'll start with pre Brigham. So I think I think the committee probably knows, but we do have new members, um, that Brigham was the major decision that was issued back, I believe, in 1997, uh, which found that the the way in which Vermont funded uh, education uh, was unconstitutional because it created an equity, uh, both from, from a taxpayer standpoint and from a student standpoint. So what I wanna do first is just to explain to you what the Brigham Court was looking at. Um, and I have just a few slides here to show this. And these slides are by way of a, a lawyer that used to work an office named Peter Griffin, who was a fabulous, fabulous tax lawyer. So on these colorful slides at the beginning, I'll give him credit for, for creating them. Um, so the way this worked before Brigham was we had a foundation plan. And this example uh, shows how it works. Um, you have um, a foundation amount. Uh, I can't point to it because I don't have control, but under example town, there's a foundation amount of 5,000 per pupil. So what that says is that the state is expecting towns to spend 5,000 per pupil or more. Um, and then you have a base rate of 1%. So the way that works is if you have a town, example town here, it has a small grand list of $400,000, just by way of example to make it easy. At $400,000, um, at 1% base rate, it can raise 4,000 per student. Okay? And that's the that's blue area here. Uh, but the state wants uh, a minimum of uh, 5,000 per pupil. So how does it get there? Well, the state gives a grant. So the foundation grant amount in the red um, is $1,000 per pupil. And that's how this town gets 5,000 per pupil. So it raises money at 1%, then it gets additional money from the state, okay? If you go to the next slide, it shows the equity issues, uh, and it's best demonstrated by taking two towns. Um, so one town has a lot of property wealth, and the other one has much less. They both want to spend 10,000 per pupil, and again, like the prior example, the foundation amount is 5,000 per pupil, and the base rate is 1%. So if we go to the next slide, what happens here now is um, the property rich town has a grand list of $1 million. At 1%, it can raise 10,000 per pupil, okay? It doesn't have to resort to foundation grant because it can raise it on its own. Property poor town with 400,000 grand list, again, just like before, uh, can raise 4,000 and will get a grant for 1,000. So the question is, how does it get from that 5,000 amount up to 10,000, uh, like the property rich town has? So go to the next slide, uh, Jess. What happens is it has to raise that, that excess amount on its own. So that green amount there is raised through higher taxes in the property poor town. And that results in, next slide, that results in the property poor town having a tax rate of 2.25% in order to raise 10,000 per pupil, while the property rich town can raise that same amount on 1%. Okay. 
And that is the equity problem that Brigham was looking at. Um, so that just sums up for you kind of the baseline as to what the issue was going into Brigham. Let me pause there and just see if there are any questions. No? Okay. Next slide. Oh, you have, you have a raised hand, I think. Yeah, can I ask a question? Yeah, when we talk about um, property rich, is there, are there distinctions in like second homes? What types of property is it? We're looking now at, at homestead properties. So okay. not, like at, the primary homestead. Correct, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so the Vermont Constitution has two clauses that are very important to this conversation. One's called the Education Clause, and it gives a right to education. So it says a competent number of schools ought, these days we would say shall, uh, be maintained in each town unless the General Assembly permits other provisions to the convenient instruction of youth. Two important points about this clause. First is it's unusual or less common at least, for a state to have a right to education in its constitution. Vermont was quite unique at the time in doing that. The, the US Constitution does not have this clause. There's no right to education in the US Constitution. Second thing is, um, it says that schools uh, shall be maintained in each town unless, and that unless is the way we get to tuition districts. So. General Assembly has allowed towns to tuition their students, and that's the language that permits tuition. And then there's a second clause called the Common Benefits Clause. Uh, it's a right to essentially equal opportunity. So it says the government is, or ought to be, instituted for the common benefit, protection, and security of the people, nation, or community, and not for the particular moment, sorry, or advantage of any single person, family, or set of persons who are part of only that community. So when you put these two clauses together, um, the Brigham Court, I have a, sorry, I have a thing on my screen. The Brigham Court uh, essentially said that it creates a right to substantial equality of education, educational opportunity. Let's turn next to Brigham. So Brigham from 1997, um, Brigham held that the current education financing system with its substantial dependence on local property taxes and resultant wide disparities in revenues available to local school districts deprive children of an equal educational opportunity in violation of the U.S. Constitution. And note here, there are two levels of inequity that Brigham Court found. One was taxpayer inequity, um, I, by the way, that example of the two towns. And that led to unequal educational opportunities because it led to unequal resources. So, um, and note too that th these two levels of inequity were across the whole state. Okay, it wasn't a local issue, it wasn't like a here or there issue, it was an issue across the entire state. So, next slide. Uh, Graham said that the distribution of a resource as precious as educational opportunity may not have its determining force, the mere fortuity of a child's residence. And the parties in Brigham, on uh, both sides, conceded that the foundation plan resulted in unequal opportunities for students. But the state argued that this was justified by the state's interest in promoting local control. Next slide. Uh, the Brigham Court rejected that argument, holding that the constitutional right to a substantial equality of educational opportunity is essentially a state mandate that can't be overridden by local control. Therefore, the court held that to fulfill its constitutional obligation, the state must ensure substantial equality of educational opportunity throughout Vermont. Okay. Next slide. Uh, and then, as a consequence, Vermont's education funding system was substantially changed by Acts 60 and 68 to comply with Brigham. And since that time, the Vermont Supreme Court has not, in any meaningful way, analyzed 
those causes in connection with education. So all we have as precedent in this area is Brigham. There's nothing after that that really guides us. Okay, next slide. Just a moment about Act 60. Um, uh, it retained local control over spending decisions, uh, but created a system of tax rate equity. So two towns with the same per pupil spending have the same spending adjusted tax rate, Homestead, uh, and two homes, Homestead again, one in each town, who pay the same property taxes if they have the same fair market value. That's essentially the consequence of Act 60. So let's move on now to um, the next slide is getting into the weighting factors. Um, I know that you've heard from JFO on the weighting factors, but it's complicated, it's hard to understand, and I thought it would be useful to highlight some of this again for you before we talk about these bills. Um, so the property tax rate and the income sensitized rate are based on a school district's per pupil spending. We're talking about homestead again, okay? Um, so per pupil spending is really important here. And per pupil spending is determined by dividing education spending from the school dis district's approved budget. Let's just say they approved $20 million in education spending by the number of equalized pupils. We're gonna come back to that. Let's say you have 1,500 equalized pupils. So when you divide that, you get per pupil spending of 13,333. Okay? If there were um, more, if there were less equalized pupils, 1,200, per pupil spending would be higher. It'd be 16,666. Um, and if there are more equalized pupils, per pupil spending would be lower. So the key point I'm making here is that um, the higher the equalized pupils are, the higher number of pupils you have, equalized pupils, results in lower tax rates, and lower equalized pupils result in higher tax rates. So the calculation of equalized pupils is really important in determining your tax rate. So let's go to how that's done. Um, in order to determine equalized pupils, a number of weighting factors are applied to our school district's student count. The school district student count is basically its enrollment. And the term that you, you'll hear is ADM, average daily membership. But ADM is just a count of enrollment that's done every year, okay? So the policy behind applying weighting factors to student enrollment is to provide more resources for school districts that have a relatively higher number of students that need those extra resources. So you're weighting students, giving them a higher weight than one or a lower weight than one in accordance to the resources required to educate that student. Uh, Pre-K students are weighted low. There are 0.46, so less than half of a student. Elementary and kindergarten students are weighted at one. So same as enrollment, one. Uh, secondary students are, are at, secondary means seven to 12, are rated at 1.13, a bit higher, because you have to offer additional classes and programs for high school students. And students who are from low-income homes or are English language learners receive an additional weighting. Okay, next slide. Weightings are a zero sum game. And this is really, really important. Um, so for example, if there's a higher weighting for one school district with more students who are from low income homes, that, that district receives a higher weighting. That results in another school district with fewer of these type of students receiving a lower weighting. So this is how you get to equalize people. So the notion being that that what you're doing basically is you're shifting resources from one school district to another. So if one school district has higher need, needs more resources to educate its students, it's gonna have a lower tax rate. And as a consequence, another school district with less need for resources is gonna have a higher tax rate. So it's a shift among school districts of tax rates. Uh, which means that all districts are supporting students who need support. Um, 
they're all pitching in. And that's, that's how the whole financing system works to, to make it fair. Uh, note that the way is not directly provide further resources for school districts that have a relatively higher number of students that need those extra resources. That would be the case of grant funding. So if you didn't have weights, you could do grant funding and give money directly to school districts to be spent on students who need support. This doesn't do that. This results in both to lower educational tax rates and the ability of a school district to move to more cheaply increase education spending and provide additional resources. It creates more tax capacity. So it's not providing funds directly, it's creating more tax capacity that could be used to support these students. School districts may not choose to provide additional resources, but might, might, instead, might instead benefit from lower educational tax rates. It's a local choice what to do with this extra tax capacity. So, I, Representative James, did you have a question there? No. You're, okay. <laughs> so, just just an example of a grant is the special ed grant. Currently, that 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 schools that schools get, and part of our challenge there is it's a very complicated, cumbersome way of getting those funds. Um, other grants could be transportation, correct? That would be an example of a, of a grant that a school district gets to cover a cost versus rolling it into per pupil spending. Yeah. Or a small school grant. Or a small yeah. schools grant, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Representative Austin? Yes, um, I guess I'm curious as to um, if it would be possible if we didn't, um, you know, change the weight, well, change the weighting, but provide grants as opposed to um, sending money back to the local school districts so that we would know that that money would be used to help children who are struggling. That would be a policy decision. I mean, it could be that the town or the local district, uh-huh. Is, can you understand the rationale? Because a town could just lower their tax rates and those children could still struggle. Correct, that, that, that's a policy decision uh, that you're able to make. Um, I heard testimony last week, I think from Secretary French about the, the pitfalls of grant funding too, which is if you're grant funding, you might not appropriate funds next year because you're squeezed, right? So it might be hard to maintain. Um, there are, so there's a balance here. It's a policy question for you uh, as to how you create equity. But Tammy Colby testified last week that no matter what you do on grant funding, the weighting formula has to be corrected to make the whole system right. work properly. Right. I um, understand. So whether you're doing grants separately, her position is at least, or as I heard it, this has to be addressed anyway. And we will. Right. I we will get yes. her, we will get Tammy Colby yeah. in. I, yeah, I, yeah, and that's not for me a comment on really, I'm just okay. reminding you of testimony that you, you, I think you've heard. That's a question, be, that's a question before the committee, um, I would say. So I see you've got a few more slides, Jim. Yep, can we keep going on the slides, yep, yep. almost done. Okay, um, so, um, Act 173 uh, commissioned a review of the weighing factors. Um, that report found that the weighing formula does not reflect contemporary educational circumstances and costs, and that the existing weights have a weak, weak, have weak ties, if any, to the resources need, needed. And the weighing report recommends adjusting the weight and adding new weights. Let's scroll down one more slide. And then we're going back to Brigham. This is the last slide before we go, go into the bills. So remember that Brigham found two levels of inequity, taxpayer inequity, remember that, that poor and rich town, different tax rates, leading to unequal educational opportunities for students. Brigham found that the distribution of a resource as precious as educational opportunity may not have as its determining factor for us, the mere fertility of the child's residence. So as we look at the current weighing factors, 
They may result in taxpayer inequity because school districts receive a relative tax advantage or disadvantage from the weights. So if it's not fairly designed, uh, it could, could result in taxpayer inequity. That may result to that may result um, to unequal educational opportunities for students. Your school districts, which are most in need of additional resources, are not gaining the taxing capacity to afford those resources. And it may, may result in unequal educational opportunities based on the mere fatuity of a child's residence. So this is how this whole conversation ties back to Brigham and the concerns that were raised in that case. Okay, so I'm done with that kind of framing exercise. It's just open for questions at, at the moment. Um, so is it fair to say that both Brigham and the report of Dr. Colby address with the funding side, but not the spending side? Um, yeah, so basically the result of Brigham was to reform the tax structure in a way that would hopefully provide more resources for students, right? And now again, we're talking about reforming the tax structure, the wings now, uh, in order to hopefully provide more resources for students. Excuse me, that's that's what I, I meant. That's the, the tax taxpayer side. Um, Representative Arison. Yeah, uh, Jim. I don't know if you can help me out or not. One question that I get, and I'm going to receive it quite often at school meetings in a few weeks. Is there anywhere where you can find the formula that actually determines the tax rate? I understand the weighting factor. I understand if you spend more than 18700 but I don't understand the sausage mill that goes through to, to come to the tax rate. I think the best way to approach that um, comparison is to have JFL come in and do a, cap do a, a, a worksheet for you and show you how it works. And there is a formula on for deck. that, but I'm not the one that really can present that. Okay. She's, uh, she's actually on deck to do that and will show us how uh, per pupil spending and um, average daily membership, how, how that math works works out. Um, okay. Whether That's a little premature. That. Oh, it, you, you were, we're really going to need this because it's, uh, it's very helpful. <laughs> you did it for us last year and um, it was very helpful. And I'm sure all of us are struggling to remember a lot of it. So, um, so please, I see any other questions so far at this level before we go to the two bills? Uh, seeing none, um, let's go. Okay, so we haven't to the most quite yet. We're gonna take a detour into the waiting report itself. So okay. Josh, if you pull up the waiting report, and go to page. Yep, which page? Uh, I'm getting there. Um, okay, <laughs> page five has a big chart called E1. Right there. Oh, right there. And can we make that bigger somehow? So we can see it right there. Oh, great. Great, right there. Okay, so this this uh, table E1 here is important because um, both bills we're about to talk to use this table, use the, the, the results from this table. So what this shows is um, on the left-hand side, you've got various cost factors. So um, student needs, um, context, grade range, we'll come back to that. But what you're looking at here is what are the weights, what should be the weights for various categories. So first under measure, you've got the poverty rate uh, for uh, poverty rate consideration, number of English or percentage of English language learners. And then you go down to um, what happens when you have um, a small school, so under 100 students or a school that has 101 to 250 students. What happens when we have a rural district, so very few people per square mile. What happens uh, for uh, grades, most school grades and secondary school grades and pre-K. So these are all of the different categories where you're gonna find weights. Um, 
So the, the third column is the existing weight. So today we have, um, starting at the bottom, we have the 0.46 weight for pre-K that I mentioned. We have secondary uh, students, which is grade seven through 12, being weighted at 1.13. Um, we've got poverty, uh, poverty weight of 0.25%. And uh, English language learners get 0.2%. Uh, so what this means is, is that you're taking under current law, you're taking, for example, a student who is in secondary school, so like grade nine, that student will be counted at 1.13, not one, but 1.13. So more resources are necessary for that student. If that student, um, ninth grade student, is from a low income family, there's an additional weight for poverty. And if that student is uh, English language learner, there's an additional weight too. So you add them up. So um, that is the way the system works currently. Then there are two proposals on the right-hand side. I see people are raising their hands. So maybe I should pause there before I go on. Yes. Uh, Representative Arison, is that a new hand? Or... Okay. Representative Austin. How are the poverty rates determined? Is it like free and reduced lunch? Is yes. that Okay. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go back to the um, report. Okay, so they've got two new weights, two columns of new weights, and this is confusing. Um, um, and the first column says new weight derived from models without controls for SWDs. And the second is the same, but it says with controls for SWDs. So what does that mean? SWDs are students with disabilities. Um, and why this is confusing is it links over to a different subject. So we're talking now about weights for tax purposes, right? But in special education reform, the funding reform, when we're moving from reimbursement model to a census grant model, um, there, was, there is a notion that certain supervisory unions should get more money, grant, grant money, than the census grant would provide. Um, so supervisory unions with a very high level of students from poverty, um, uh, might need more resources. So what these two columns are doing, it says you can do it two ways. You can fix for that. You can fix that special education piece by adjusting the weights more. And that's what the, the controls for SWDs, the, the column second in from the right, that's what that's doing. Or uh, you can not try to fix that with weights you can just adjust the weight and then fix that issue over by increasing the census grant amount. So there are two approaches here that ties over to the way special education is being funded. And that's why it's confusing. Um, the way in which both bills approach this we're about to go through is to use the far right column. So that's to say, we're gonna adjust the weights without thinking about census grant funding for special education. And if you want to fix that, you can fix it over there. Um, that's, that's, as we talk about what's going on in these bills, it's looking at that last column. But the last column says is that, uh, starting at the bottom again, uh, and reading up, um, pre-K is the same. Um, Pre-K doesn't change. Um, but secondary grade enrollment does change. So um, you're moving to um, uh, basically a system where grades, I think it's seven through 12, we get a 1.2 weight. Uh, it's up from um, 1.13. And uh, middle grades, um, 
it's kind of to find, but like it's like seven or eight or I, I don't have that in front of me, but basically you you you're having uh, different weights now broken broken down for middle school and secondary, where before it was just one point one three. Now you've got 120, 1.12, and 1.23. I see. Then moving up, you've got population density and enrollment. So if you come from a rural district, okay, so you have less than 36 people per square mile, the idea is it takes more resources to educate students in a rural district. So you have a new weight of 0.23 added to a student from a rural district. Uh, but if it's a lot less rural, so you've got up to 55 people, um, 36 to 55, you get 0.17. And if you're from an uh, area that has 55 to 100, you get 0.11. But the idea is that it's recognizing that kids from a rural area cost more to educate. Then if you hit that test, then you look at school enrollment. And if in addition to being rural, you've got a small school with an enrollment of less than 100 students. Um, you get an additional weight of 0.26. And if your school is a little bit bigger, between 101 and 250, you get an additional weight of, uh, of 0.12. The very big changes are up top. So um, you're moving uh, under this scenario to a weighting for poverty of 2.97. So you're counting essentially that one student um, who is a poverty, living in poverty, that student's counting for basically three students. Okay? It's a high weight uh, saying that needs, that student needs a lot more resources than other students. And for the um, uh, English language learners, you're getting a much higher weight too of 1.58 as opposed to 0.20 today. So that's a column we're using. You'll see that in, um, in Revsibilia's bill. Um, and uh, you see a reference to that in Senator Bruce bill. So before I move on from that, are there any questions about that? Because I know that's, that's a complicated topic. I see Representative Conlon. Thanks, uh, one question and one comment. I'm gonna do the comment first and that's just to point out to people that the 2.97 in the top right would be added to the one point whatever from the numbers down below. So you're, you're counting that, that student as potentially four, uh, four plus. Uh, my question, Jim, and this has always confused me, um, how do we define a student with a disability? Is that equal to a student on an IEP? I'm not sure. I didn't look in the report. I'm sorry uh, for calling them for that. I didn't look in the report. It would be a student on an IEP, I believe, also maybe a 504 plan. That's what I remember. It was IEP or 504. Okay, great. Thank we you. Check that though. Representative James. Thanks, Chair Webb. I don't know if this is a testimony question or a Jim question. Um, Jim, if you are the person to ask, what can you remind me about about the derivation of the current existing weights? Because I seem to recall that they were um, maybe not scientifically derived. That's what the report says. So uh, Tim Nicole's testimony was, I believe that they were not scientifically derived based upon resource needs, no analysis. They were basically, I'm not sure how they were derived, but uh, it was kind of a belief that it seemed fair, I think at the time. And maybe it was, it, was, it was from other states that had adopted ways at, at that time, but wasn't done with a rigorous analysis as you've seen here. Okay, thanks. There was a follow-up um, email that I got at the time from uh, George Cross, who was on the committee when um, they worked on Act 60, and he indicated that they, it, they did consider it. Um, I don't know what they considered, but the, the Colby report did not did not find any evidence of it being um, scientifically considered. But I'm, I'm happy to check with George Cross to see if he remembers what they considered. I, I'm not sure it's relevant 
<laughs> going forward. I, I mean, we know now that they're, they're inaccurate in our current context. I, I was just curious. Um, Representative Brady. This may be a sort of dumb question, <laughs> but I'm trying to understand on all the waiting for school size and density, which makes sense, how that interacts with our policies and some efforts to also realize efficiencies in school consolidation in some district consolidations. Like are there are are we sort of setting up two opposing systems here where in one place we're trying to incentivize and encourage more consolidation and is this sort of doing the opposite but I also realize I mean some towns and schools are are so, so remote that it does not consolidation isn't a, a reality or a, a, a good option in a lot of places either so I'm trying to understand the interplay of that of those two forces. It, it's definitely uh, a point of discussion, and I do believe that um, that would be, we, we can talk with um, Tammy Colby about that, because I do be believe she did reference that as well, uh, if you're remembering, Jim. Uh, I can't recall that, but. There's, there is a competing interest in terms of what Act 40, there may be, I don't know if there is, between Act 46 and, and the, the current weights addressing the small schools and, and rurality. Um, but that would be, uh, we'll speak with Timmy Colby about that. Um, Representative Austin. I just want to um, kind of check out an assumption. This also could be a dumb question, but I'm assuming that um, with, let's say this additional funding um, that school boards um, could hire more teachers or hire more master teachers because of the increase in their funding. Is that accurate to assume? Yes. Well, it's, it's, it's more funding. They can choose to. I mean, it's more tax capacity. They can choose to ra raise taxes to have more resources for these students and spend it however they think appropriate to support those students. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's I just, go ahead. Go ahead. I was gonna say I, I was wanna uh, I was channeling my inner Mark Perot, uh, <laughs> but Jim Jim jumped the jumped me on that. And that, that just to remember that this is about taxing capacity. It is not about more revenue from the state. Yeah, it's the same amount of money, it just gets divided up differently. Um, or it could be the same amount of money. <laughs> um, Representative Brady, did you have another one? Yeah, I'm probably way off in left field now, but seeing the policy like sense of all of this and the reports and the research it's coming out of, and also the fact that we're talking about taxes and tax rates and not necessarily defining what will happen educationally with these dollars, is there, would there be any sense in, this is maybe I'm just like asking the universe, <laughs> uh, in, in somehow also like addressing in, in EQS, like that, that certain, you know, certain student populations that, that your EQS ratios maybe should be different if you have students who are weighted so heavily or your qualifications should be, I, I don't know, that's obvious. Maybe that's just opening a whole other can of worms, but I'm, I'm wondering about the like making sure things are going where they're needed. And the EQS seems like another, that the education quality standards and sort of what I know at least on our school board, you know, that's the one lever I feel like the school board's pretty familiar with and is looking at pretty carefully when we look at the budget. Um, you know, we're not all education experts on the school board, but we are aware of like, what do we have to be doing and how are we using our money to do that? So I wonder about that other place too. That will be a good part of our discussion. And I, I think there might be something in there in one of these bills. And maybe what we could do is move to the bills now. I'd like to have us out of here by noon. I don't know if that's possible. Um, well, we'll be out of here by noon, whether we're done or not. Let me put it that way. So, so Jess, let's move to H54. Okay, bringing that right up.
<laughs> however, however it works to present it to make it as easy for us to understand the differences between these bills would be helpful. Oh, they're very different. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, so this is Rep. Sebelia's bill. Um, let's scroll down a bit. Uh, and let's go right to the heart of it. Let's go right into findings. Okay. So there's a number of findings here. Um, I'm not going to go through them because you can read them on your own, but it's basically setting up this whole conversation, kind of going through what we just went through in a way. So um, I'm not going to focus on the findings. Um, so let's go on to page four. Keep going down if you would. Okay, okay, here we are. Okay, so section two is amending the statute on how wave membership is determined. Um, and the heart of this, if you scroll down to the next page, important part, keep going, is right here. Oh, up, up, right here. Um, just go up just one more line or two. Okay, so. This C section says that the secretary shall determine um, where long-term membership, where long-term membership is just a two-year average of enrollment, okay? Um, so it's gonna use a two-year average enrollment and then, and then adjust that by these weights, okay? Uh, so pre-K students are getting a 0.46 weight that's unchanged. Um, so now if you look at the new two, kindergarten to grade five is getting a weight of 1.0. That's the sa same as it was before for K through five. Grades six through eight is getting a um, 1.23 weight. Um, in grades nine through 12, it's getting a 1.20 weight. Um, and those are different. So it used to be that if you're in um, grades, kindergarten to grade six, you have a one weight. Now uh, it's now grade six to grade eight has a higher weight. And then grades nine through 12 have a higher weight. Um, I do want to check this because I think that these are reversed. Um, let me just take a look. Nope, sorry, actually. Okay, so this is correct. Um, so those are the, are the new weights. Um, that's exactly from that column we looked at. Go down further, um, and you'll see that the poverty weight, so, uh, so it's saying that D says the, the weird launch of membership as calculated under C will be further increased to compensate for, next page, uh, it's shown costs for, for uh, imposed by students from economically deprived backgrounds. So what's happening here is we're moving up to 1.16, but remember that what we just looked at brings it to 2.97. So what's happening here is we're not phasing in the entire poverty weight in the first year because it's such a big jump. So you'll see there are a few further sections we're coming on to that gradually increase this poverty weight get to 2.97. But for the first year, it's going up to 1.16. And then in two, it's the one for English language uh, learners, and it's going up to 1.58. And that is as reflected in that column we talked about. Um, and then we're adding some new weights. So now we're saying uh, in E that the uh, long-term membership under C will be further increased for differences in the cost of education because of the higher cost of education in geographically isolated areas of the state. Uh, the adjustment should be equal to the total from C. So if you're, again, if you're a secondary school student, you have a weight of 1.2, and that will be increased, that we multiply by. Um, so if uh, you have a multiplier of 0.23, uh, where you have 35 or fewer, uh, people per square mile, um, and then scroll down further, Jess. Um, 
you have uh, additional a multiplier of 0.17, uh, where the uh, population density is 36 to 56, and then, then 0.11, where the density is 56 or more, but fewer than 101. So that's your rural, rural density weighting that's new. Then in addition, it says, if the number of persons per square mile uh, in the school district is 55 or fewer, then uh, you get an additional weight for small school size. So um, go to the next page. You're going to get um, an adjustment, further adjustment of 0.26. Um, multiply that the number of students enrolled in school uh, with basically 100, 100 or fewer students. And for a school with 100 to 251 students, you get a multiplier of 1.2. Again, right from that same column we talked about before. Um, so that's basically the changes to these existing weights and new weights being added. Section 2A um, is um, the phase in of the poverty weight. So I mentioned before that we were going from 0.25 to 1.16 in the second year of implementation, it's going to 2.06. In the next section, 2B, you scroll down further, you're going a bit further, a bit further, ah, you're going up to the, right there, up to the 2.97. So after three years, you get the poverty ratio up to, uh, what they call them, have it at 2.97. I see we have a raised hand, so let me pause there. Yes, please, uh, Representative Arison. All right, the numbers we're seeing in the proposed bill uh, from the weighting study? Yes, they're from that very column we went through. So the very right hand okay. column um, of table E1. And, and they're being stepped up in, in increments to get uh, to the only final numbers? One of them is being stepped up. Everything is coming into uh, force. At the same time, except for the poverty rate, because it's going up so high okay. uh, from where it was, that's being phased in. Thank you. Yep. Anything more before I go, I go on? Uh, yeah, I, on yeah, this, yeah. this is a math question. Uh, you keep using the verb multiplied. Um, I just want to make sure that that's correct as opposed to added to. And, and I guess what would probably help as we get into this in, in detail is one of your sort of handwritten flow charts that shows the, the calculations and how they're created. Yeah, unfortunately, it's very complicated because we have some that are a percentage of, we have some that are multiplied by, we have some that are added to. Uh, and it's just the way Vermont's done. So, Tammy Colby was testifying. She says she had to fit this into our system. Uh, and that was quite challenging for her. But yeah, it is quite complicated. And I think I think Chloe's going to help a little bit. <laughs> OK, just scroll down to the next section. So now we have a section um, which is basically a uh, mitigation for dramatic increases in tax rates as a consequence of this change. So it says that for fiscal years 23, 24, and 25, an increase to a municipality's property, property tax rate that equals or exceeds 20% of what that municipal, municipal tax rate would have been, but for the amendments we just went through, shall be mitigated. So if you're seeing a 20% jump of your tax rate because of these changes, then there is some mitigation for you. Um, let's go down further. Uh, right there. Uh, oh, right there. Um, so if you hit that 20% threshold, then in fiscal year 23, um, that increase due to the weighting changes uh, will uh, be reduced by 75%. And then for fiscal year 24, next page, it will be reduced by 50%, and then for 25, reduced by 25%. So basically, that if you if you, if the if the consequence of the weight changes 
has a, a 20% or more effect on your tax rate, then you're going to get some mitigation and it phases down um, over time. Okay, next section is uh, says that the excess spending penalty, which is a penalty imposed on school districts when they spend too much, um, is suspended. Um, so uh, for fiscal year 22, um, and then the agency is, is going to report to you the effect of that suspension um, and uh, include any recommendation recommendations for further uh, legislation. Okay, next section five uh, talks about preservation of merger incentives. So under Act 46, there were a number of incentives given to school districts to merge, um, including some governors as to how their tax rates change. All this is saying is that, that this change of weight will not affect Act 46 merger incentives or benefits they got. So that's what this is doing. Next section. Okay, this is the repeal of small school grants. So today we have a grant program for small schools. Um, in the weighting formula, we have, as we just talked about, uh, a new weight that would be for small schools. So rather than doing it through a grant, it would be done through the tax weighting. So this small school grant would be um, repealed. So keep going down further. Yeah. On. Right there. And then there are a couple of just technical conforming change, changes to that. So seven is just a conforming change to reflect the small school grants no longer around. And likewise, section eight is a technical change to reflect the next page that the um, sponsored grant is no longer around. So um, those are just technical conforming changes. Um, and then we come on to a section about um, non-operating school districts. So if you are a tuition school district, obviously you're paying tuition to another district that operates a school. So what this is saying is that um, the weighting changes are designed to reflect the actual cost of educating students, taking into account student needs and the characteristics of their educational environments. Non-operating school districts pay tuition. Uh, a non-operating school district counts resident students toward its equalized pupil count. So if you're a tuition district, you get uh, a tax rate, just like every other school district does based upon number of students. What this is saying is that the tuition you're paying to the, to the operating school um, doesn't necessarily match the re resources necessary to educate that student. It doesn't really match necessarily what you're getting uh, as, as, as a tax rate. So there's a disconnect today, before we even talk about changing the weights, uh, there's a disconnect today between these things. Um, so this is saying that unless the tuition paid for a student by a non-operating school district to a receiving school district reflects the cost, basically in that student, the amount of tax benefit to the non-operating school district and the amount of cost to educate the student, scroll down a bit further, Jess. Um, a bit higher. <laughs> um, where are we here? Um, won't be equivalent. So what this is doing is saying we need to look at this question. We need to look at how how tuition is determined, um, how tax rates is determined for now operating districts, and make sure that tuition paid reflects the actual resources necessary to educate that student. So the next section goes on to require. Uh, before December 15th, the Secretary of Education will look at the, in this question and uh, report to you how the statute's government payment of tuition uh, should be amended to ensure that the tuition paid for a student um, uh, reflects the cost of educating that student. Um, so that's what that does. 
And then next is a report um, on a um, number of reports here. The first report required is a report by AOE in collaboration with JFO to uh, calculate there are 88 players on the stand. Oh, oh, sorry. To calculate the um, cumulative over, under and over taxing that resulted from the, um, the current uh, weighting. So uh, recognizing that the current weighting is from grounded and good science, I guess. Um, this is saying, go back and look at the effect of that um, on uh, taxing. Next section, section 11 is another report which looks at, at uh, the Agency of Education identifying the cost and student outcomes from this issue. Okay. And then the next section 13 is a moratorium on changes to the tax system until the Jewish Assembly um, has time to consider the recommendations and has acted on the report. And there's a hand, I believe, from Rep. Austin. So let me pause. Please, three. Can you go back to section 12 for one minute? Yep. I just, what, what is that actually saying? The agency of education is to uh, look at how students have been affected, basically, by the current funding system, by the current weights. Mm -hmm. And to see what the outcomes were, to see if there was to identify, I think, inequity and what happened as a consequence. So, is there, is there any um, kind of follow up, like two years or three years, let's say, if the weights are readjusted, will they look again to see, like looking at this and then, you know, comparing it to after? Yep. Yeah, we're coming on to that just moment. And they'll look at and they'll look at student outcomes as well. Yeah, let's go on to that. We have a section on that coming up. Sorry. Out. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so we have a moratorium on changing the tax system. Um, and then we have this uh, to, to Rep. Austin's point. Section 14 creates a, a joint uh, legislative education oversight committee. Uh, and it's Function is to monitor, evaluate, research, oversee, and provide a continuing continuing review of uh, implementation of the weighting formula changes uh, and the effect on student it's called student uh, equity outcomes. Um, the membership is six members, uh, which are the um, chair or designees of the. House and Senate Committees on Appropriations and on Education, um, House Committee on Ways and Means, and Senate Committee on Finance. Uh, powers and duties are um, to show review JFO data on education budgets and education tax rates, take testimony from stakeholders, assess the work of the agency implementing the waiting form of changes uh, at the request of, uh, of House and Senate Committees. Um, research and examine issues that may lead to further further action, and five, uh, provide information and assistance to other committees on these matters. And going on, typically, for the chair, um, you've got um, going down, just uh, quorum of voting is pretty standard. Um, keep going down. So this, uh, sorry, go up a bit. Uh, right there. Oh, a little bit more. Right there. Meetings. Um, so the first meeting has to be called on before our one of, of uh, 2022. That dates further out because this whole act doesn't implement until a year out. So we're not starting this whole thing until July 1 of 2022. So that's why this date's quite far out for this uh, oversight committee. There's to be twice a year uh, during fiscal years 23 through 28. Uh, let's go on further, if you would. Keep going. To meet more frequently. Um, and uh, I'll stop there. Um, yeah, it gets uh, 
gets compensation. Um, the report is given, it's given reports on before each of uh, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six years. So it has time to actually consider the full impact of these new weights. So it's got quite a, a time span to it. And it has a standard compensation and reimbursement provision. And then appropriation of $2,400 this year to pay for that. And then go down further. And then there's a report on uh, programmatic changes. So this requires that on before um, August 31 of each of these years, 23 through 27, each school district shall report to the agency on programmatic changes resulting from the weighing formal changes, including increases and decreases in pro programmatic investments. So what this is doing is saying, okay, okay, so we lower your, your tax rates uh, to recognize that you've got more student community support. And this is saying, how have you actually use the tax capacity? Have you e increased programs? Have you decreased programs? What have you done with it? Um, so that's what this is designed to do. Um, and then uh, lastly, agency will compile the results from those reports and report them to you, uh, or so, sorry, to the Joint Legislative Education Oversight Committee and that can be able to report, report to you on the results. Um, and then lastly, we've got the effective dates. So as I mentioned, think about basically next year. Um, and then you have a phase in for the, the, the um, we mentioned poverty weights are being phased in. You have a phase in schedule to get those fully implement, implemented. So that was a lot. <laughs> Let me pause there. So this is a this is an implementation plan, um, which will be different from the other bill. This this, this is actually implementing. Yeah. The next bill is a is a, a plan to implement. This is actually implementing. Implementing. Yeah. Um, Representative Harrison. Yeah. Quick question from a first year legislator. There's a ton of dates in this bill. Uh, that. Pregnant, are pregnatory on the bill being passed this session? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So if it was delayed by a year, we push all those dates out by a year, but yes. Okay. That's kind of what I thought. Thank you. Why don't we um, just review what the differences are in the in the Senate bill? Okay. I can do that quite quickly, actually, because it's a very yeah. different concept. So if you bring yeah. up just S13 from it, Okay, and scroll down, get past the findings. Findings, I won't go through, keep going, keep going. Okay, right here, uh, oh, back up, okay. So this is, right there, very different approach. So this is implementing the report. This is basically having the agency um, think about how to implement the report. So this is on before December 15th of this year, the agency in collaboration with the State Board of Education and various stakeholders, including the bees, um, shall develop a plan of implementation. The reports, oh, go up, sorry. Um, a plan for implementation of the weighting changes found in that very same table we talked about, table E1, um, new weight derived from models with controls for SWDs, same same one, so as we went through in the other bill, is the target. Um, and then the implementation plan shall include, scroll down a bit, a timeline for phasing in, uh, design for the implementation that's sensitive to tax rates, um, consideration of the new formats interaction with other provisions of law, including excess spending penalty threshold, effect on non operating districts, districts, paid tuition, uh, small school grants. Uh, in Act 46. So things we just went through, they'll be thinking about those things. And then, um, and then uh, as part of this, the state board will go uh, and hold informational, information sections around the state, either virtually or in person. They will hold, uh, scroll down, at least six meetings, the purpose of which is to educate the public about these, uh, these changes uh, and gather their input. Uh, so, um, and then it would um, refer, 
refer this to the agency, which we use the input to, input to inform its implementation plan. Um, and then I'll deliver that plan uh, to you by December 15th of 2021. And then uh, this is a piece of session logic that says that the expectation is that next year you would implement the, the report. So this is a one year study about implementation and then next year you would take action as opposed to the Stability Bill, which is you're taking action this year. And this would be a plan that would come in at the end of 2021. So basically knowing how things go, they'd have until this bill passed and through and signed into law and December 15th to um, come up with a plan for the next legislative session. Yeah, correct. correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, Representative Arison, did you have a, a question or is that polls? <laughs> This is obviously a significant conversation, um, quite significant. Um, and whatever we do, we'll end up over in ways and means at some point. So in terms of, you know, it's 11.58, um, please send me a note on who you think you would like to hear from uh, related to this other than our usual suspects, which would be the Agency of Education, uh, the, um, the, the uh, Vermont Education Associations, um, Tammy Colby, and if anybody thinks of anybody else, uh, let me know. It, it may be yeah. worth pointing out too, Kate, that this is probably not the last two bills that we're gonna see on this. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know that I think there's more action happening in the Senate. Well, and there's a, a bill I know that was sent around to everybody to look at um, from Representative Beck, yeah. which is far more encompassing, includes waiting and a lot of other things. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure, sure where that bill is going to go, whether it's going to come to our right. committee or, or, or ways and means directly. Um, Representative Austin. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I guess. You know, I would like to avoid the situation that we had in this day with Act 46, with the implementation. You know, that was that's that was pretty divisive. And I don't know who, if there's someone out there that can think about what would be the best way to move forward with the implementation of the waiting study, you know, so that it didn't become you know, I don't want to delay time because I think it's important that it happen. But I don't want to become time. You know, a, a conflict between children who need ELL instruction and children who are uh, living in poverty. I, I don't want it to be the haves and the haves nots and have a big eruption about that. And I don't know if there's someone that could advise us as to the best way to reach our goal. And um, you know, I like the idea in the Senate bill of bringing, you know, the public hearings. I always feel that that at least people have been heard on their position and that that might make the transition easier. We'll hear from the state board too. Um, I would say that at this point then um, we can break. We are on the floor at 1.15. Um, we will come back here um, 10 minutes after floor. Um, and I'm hoping that, that uh, Chloe Wexler will be able to join us at that time. Um, and then at three o'clock, we have a report from the select committee and the Vermont State Colleges. They'll be checking in with us. So it's a, it's a very full day. <laughs> And um, I, I appreciate so much the work that you did, um, Jim Damaray, on providing the background. I think that the committee has needed that. Um, it was really helpful. You're welcome. Yeah. I think it might help prepare us a little bit for Chloe as well and some of, some of the math that she may be putting forward. Okay. With that, 